an age when many of you were waking up worrying about your GCSE revision or A-level results, I was waking up with a slightly different problem. I was in a prison cell. I won't bore you with the details, but for the record, I don't recommend it. Much more recently, I awoke one weekend morning to find myself on the Sunday Times bestsellers list. They were two very different mornings filled with very different emotions. And hearing them both will speak to you in one of two ways. Some of you might be wondering why a guy who dropped out of school early and left with no qualifications at all has been asked to speak at a TEDx event focused on education. And I sympathise with that view. The irony is certainly not lost on me. Others might be curious to try and understand why the education system didn't work for somebody who didn't have genius level IQ but was certainly more than able to string together tens of thousands of perfectly readable words. Either way, it's worth me explaining that the way that I felt sat inside that prison cell, hemmed in by those four walls, feeling desperate to get out into the fresh air, was extraordinarily similar to the way that I felt sat in a school classroom. Uncomfortable, enclosed, and quite miserable. But that's enough about me for the moment because I realise, respect and appreciate that I don't represent the entire population. So let's just take a step back a minute and look at the bigger picture. Because for all those great discussions about STEM and SATs, class sizes and curriculum content, today I want to strip it all right back and ask one single question. What is the ultimate point of education? It's the sort of discussion that would probably make or break a dinner party. But in the lead up to this event, it's one that I've thought about long and hard. And to keep a very long answer short, I'd suggest that it's to add value to society by helping young people. And if I'm allowed a second sentence, I'd also say that the process of being educated should teach people a wide range of skills and knowledge whilst also contributing positively to both their physical and mental health. So teenagers leave school with more than just a bank of information and certificates. They should actually have the practical skills that will enable them to take on useful roles within society. They should also have the confidence, the energy and the agility to excel. That's what we need to be giving them. But I appreciate that's a lot to ask for. So it's important to understand the wider context because 50 years ago, school had subtly different responsibilities. There was no technology, there was no internet, there was barely a health and safety culture. But as a result, children spent a lot more time unsupervised outdoors. Now I'm not some dinosaur that believes olden really was golden. Of course, there are huge advantages in the advent of tech, the internet and a society that was more risk averse than before. But when children are coming home from school and spending hours and hours indoors with a phone, a tablet or a laptop for company, they're simply not getting the adventures, the exposure to risk, nor the benefits of an outdoor, active, healthy lifestyle. And it's very easy to turn a blind eye to this sort of thing, in fact many people do, until you realise what it's doing to swathes of our population, particularly in urban areas. A great friend of mine who works in early years primary education told me a story very recently. They were showing a group of kids a book for the very first time in their lives. And all of those kids tried to swipe their finger across it to turn the pages. 
For me, that is symptomatic of something that is genuinely tragic, not only for those kids, but for society as a whole. And we really, really need to regain some balance, which means ensuring children access and enjoy the outdoors more. It means letting them take calculated risks. It means allowing them to push themselves physically and mentally whilst removing their dependency on screens. And if parents are worried about that, or they're happy for their children to arrive home from school and spend hours with their heads bent over devices, then what we need to do is find a way, when children are in school, to give them more time in the outdoors. Which means schools have a responsibility to try and help provide a bit more balance. And yet, computer science aside, the what and how many children are learning these days at school isn't that much different than what I was supposed to be learning if I'd have gone to school more. Nor what my parents' generation were learning either. It's classroom-based, it's desk-based, and by definition, it's indoors, with outdoor time reserved for sport. And of course, those sessions are despised by children who don't like PE or games. And that's okay for some, the academic kids that thrive in that controlled, risk-free indoor setting, the ones with long concentration spans and a very particular type of intelligence. But despite the ever-rising number of A grades or their equivalents, school is simply not working for enough of our children. And this is evidenced by three fascinating reports that I've found in the last 12 months. In September, a YouGov survey found that Britons categorically get less sleep, do less sport, and are more obese than children and people in other countries. Meanwhile, the National Child Measurement Programme reports that one in five children that started primary school a healthy size were leaving either overweight or obese. And this can't be unrelated to a UK government report in January that said one in nine children had not stepped outside onto a beach, a forest or in a park in over 12 months. So we have a system that is based indoors where schools are ranked nationally on the back of their exam results. Yet far too many teenagers are leaving very unhealthy, unworldly and more often than not uninspired. And let me add, that's despite the incredible work of some brilliant teachers in this country too. This is an issue that is fundamental to not only our health and well-being and our children's future prospects, but I can promise you that this will impact their lives infinitely more than whether their SAT scores or GCSEs are based on coursework or exams. And alongside this, the country's got a shortage in STEM skills STEM qualified children, something that we continue to fail to redress. We need free range children, children that can run through fields, that can climb trees and that can get in touch with the environment around them. Let's just remember that definition of the purpose of education, to help young people fulfill their potential, to add value to society, and to contribute positively to their physical and mental well-being. Well, society has no greater need right now than the environment, and we need people passionate about saving it, with ideas on how to reduce plastic waste, how to push us towards carbon zero, how to grow more woodlands, and how to build less wasteful vehicles and properties. All those things require imagination, and dedication combined with great passion. And passion can't be generated in the classroom in quite the same way it can be in the great outdoors. For many children, theoretical problems are just too abstract. Put them in an airless classroom, put a piece of paper in front of them and ask them a question about how long it will take them to cross a stretch of water and their eyes will quickly glaze over. Mine certainly did. But take them down to a lake or a river. Let them feel the wind in their hair, the spit of rain on their face. And then ask them how long it would take them 
to swim, to row, to paddle across that body of water beneath, before their eyes. And they'll become fascinated, I did, by the challenge, by the logistics, by the science. We need to inspire tomorrow's engineers and architects by building real tree houses and dens. We need to encourage people to recycle by taking them to landfill sites. We can learn about pollution by observing a busy road in rush hour. Let's teach them about geography by watching the water flow around the Canberra of a river. Let's learn history by going to visit historical sites and landmarks. Love and understanding of the natural world can be nurtured by picking up worms, by spotting butterflies, by feeding birds. It does not have to be a sanitised experience by watching somebody else do it on a screen or in a textbook. I hope that you can see that I'm extremely passionate about this subject. And in a world full of many problems, I believe that this is a relatively easy one to fix. So if you, like me, believe that future generations will need resilience, problem-solving skills, adaptability, if you, like me, believe that a morbidly obese population will be the death of our healthcare system and the people within it, if you, like me, believe in experimental learning, and if you, like me, believe that the countryside in our great nation is the green therapy and the oceans, rivers and lakes are blue therapy, then let's push for an education system that balances time both inside and outside the classroom. One that allows children to fall over, get wet and stimulate all their senses. And one that connects future generations much better with the environment. An American author, Tom Boddett, said what I've been trying to say for many years. In school, we're taught the lessons and given a test, but in life, we're given a test that teaches us a lesson. Thank you.